Hey, hey, it's another day and time for a cooking adventure. My name is Megan Fox and today I'm gonna to be making an entire meal for my family using all the old Mennonite recipes. It's gonna be delicious, so stay tuned. Now, Mennonite style recipes are great, even for beginners, because they just take simple, basic ingredients, not a ton of different spices and stuff, but I would say the hardest part of a traditional Mennonite meal is just simply all the options. Now, I did grow up as a Mennonite, I am a Mennonite, goodness, but I usually just cook like a meat and a vegetable most of the time, but traditionally, Mennonite meals have so many courses. Now, Mennonite communities were traditionally farming communities, and so they worked hard, so they also ate really good. Um, I know you probably all heard of the Mennonite work ethic and how we work really hard, but who's to say it might not just be because of all the good food that we eat. So today I'm gonna make a full meal with all the trimmings, but feel free to pick and choose just the ones that you wanna make or add to your meal plan for the week, or this would also make a great Easter meal, which is why I decided to post this today. Now, I did wanna say that if the format of this video feels a little bit different, I lost some audio footage. Oh, I was so sad. So I had to refilm parts of it. Um, but this video is going to be a good one and make sure you stick around to the end to see what my family thinks and to see if I actually pulled it off. So <laughs> the first thing that we're gonna do is get a ham in the oven. And I based this recipe off of the recipe I found in the Mennonite cookbook. This is a great traditional recipe book if you're looking for something um, that has like all the old classics in it. I can try to link it below for you. And I will also put all the recipes, like my versions of them, down below in the description box. There'll be a link that takes you to my website where you can find all the nice free printables for you. Cause one thing about Mennonite cookbooks is sometimes they assume that we're all great cooks and we don't need all the little different instructions. And that's not always the case. So anyway, I'm gonna get this ham in the oven and then we'll move on to the next thing. Now, as I said before, Mennonites don't use a ton of different like spices and seasonings, but there is one thing we have that really packs a punch, and I mentioned it on Instagram, and so many of you asked what in the world I was talking about, and that is brown butter. Now, Mennonites put this on everything. It tastes so good, and it's so easy to make. I will show you a little bit of a fancier version of this later when I make some for the potatoes, but basically all you do to make brown butter is you take maybe half a stick of butter per dish, and you just put it in a skillet, preferably cast iron, and then you go ahead and just keep it stirring on like medium heat till it's like bubbling and then you keep, don't walk away, you gotta keep it right there, babying it, kind of stirring it around, and eventually it's gonna turn brown. And then that's your brown butter. Or you could add breadcrumbs to it to make it um, more textured and then that goes great over potatoes, which is what I'm gonna be doing today. But yeah, you guys have to try brown butter. It's great on vegetables, potatoes, pretty much any starch, noodles, maybe not rice. And that's another thing, Mennonites eat a lot of starch, it's a lot of energy, but Mennonites also traditionally just ate what they could get off their own land, so you won't see a lot of rice dishes and stuff like that in a Mennonite cookbook. It's more like the things they were growing in their own garden or raising their own livestock, things like that. So definitely try out the brown butter, at least on something this week. So good, and butter's not bad for you. Now, every good Mennonite cook knows that you have to work ahead if you wanna make an impressive meal like this. So let's jump to yesterday when I made the pie and the deviled eggs. So nothing says Mennonite classic like red bead eggs or deviled eggs. And since it's springtime, Easter season, I thought we would go with the deviled eggs today. They are so good, a personal favorite. Just creamy and delicious and a really pretty thing to set on your table. So the way that I hard boil my eggs is I put my eggs in a kettle, cover them with water, and then I bring them to a boil. And then when they're boiling, I remove the kettle from the heat, turn it off, and I set the timer for 20 minutes. So they're just sitting there covered in the water for 20 minutes. Then I pull them off and I will give them an ice bath to cool them down really well, and then it's time to peel them. the fun part 
part where you slice each egg in half and you take out the yolks and put them together in a bowl. And then I'm gonna add a few delicious ingredients to bring these over the top, make them creamy and amazing. And you can even put this delicious creamy filling into a cake decorator and then squeeze it out in really pretty patterns. You don't gotta do that, you can just use a spoon as well. And then I like to top each one with parsley or paprika just to make it look really pretty and wow, they're just like a great centerpiece if you don't have one. description box so make sure you click on the links for them and it'll bring you up to a nice printable recipe card that you guys can print out and make whenever or just screenshot it on your phone that works too now Mennonites are big on their sour stuff so I thought I'd just show you what I used um, we always would have on my mom's side of the family the manzanilla olives stuffed with like the red pimentos they were always like devoured <laughs> And then Mennonites really love their pickles, and this is a Mennonite brand I found, Jake and Amos's Seven Day Pickles. I've actually made Seven Day Pickles before. They're like a really sweet variety, um, and that's kind of like a traditional Mennonite type of pickle. But if you can't find those in your store, go ahead and get the sweet gherkins. I personally am a fan of dill pickles, but that's not traditionally what we have at our family things. So these are the sweet gherkins from Mount Olive, and they always look really cute on a deviled egg tray. Vanilla pie, walnut crust pie, sour cream raisin pie, rhubarb pie, Quaker town crumb pie, raisin pie, prune custard pie, pumpkin pie, pineapple cream pie, pineapple sponge pie, orange pie, open face peach pie, old fashioned baked custard pie, McDonald's pie, mince meat pie. <laughs> it is safe to say that the Mennonite housewife is the perfecter of pies. And there are some really unique ones here in my Mennonite cookbook. But today we're gonna stick to an old classic and in my opinion, one of the best, Shoe fly pie. The tradition is that this pie got its name because the wives would set the pies on the windowsills to cool, and then the flies would come and they would have to shoo away the flies. Shoe fly, shoe fly, hence the name. So today we're making shoe fly pie, which is one of my husband's absolute favorites, and the key is to get king syrup. It has the best flavor, it doesn't have such a strong molasses taste, and you are going to love this. So this pie is gonna look super impressive because of the layers that are in it, but do not let that fool you. It is super easy and super fun to make. This is something you can make as a family if you have some children that are wanting to learn to bake. Um, I have a really simple, easy pie crust recipe that throws together really quickly.
flour, shortening, and sugar, and crumble that all together to make the topping. mixture is gonna go in the bottom of your pan then you're gonna make a delicious molasses I'm not a molasses girl but trust me this is super good you're gonna make this molasses gooey layer right there in the middle then you top that with more of the crumbs so pretty so delicious and then pop it in the oven at 350 degrees for about 40 minutes you want the crumbs to look a little bit brown on top but not much I do not like an overbaked pie vanilla ice cream on there and wow out of this world delicious I made two pies I put one in the freezer for later and I can't wait to surprise my husband with this one Wow, doesn't that look good? You guys definitely should try that recipe. Maybe not the mincemeat pie or some of those other odd ones. I don't know, I can't vouch for them, but the shoe fly pie, amazing. Anyway, things are about to like heat up in the kitchen here, so I'm going to work ahead again by setting the table a while. That way it's ready to go. And then I'll chat a little bit about like some Mennonite traditions. good if you can get the table set ahead of time because in a little bit I'm gonna have like four burners going in the oven and it's just gonna be a circus I'm sure now a traditional Mennonite meal always starts with jelly bread I guess you could say um, it's usually like dinner rolls or like homemade white bread sliced I grew up this way almost every meal now it wasn't always homemade bread but we would almost every meal have butter and jelly and bread and that would be like the first course of your meal you know because we're not gonna get enough starch later right <laughs> So I'm not gonna include a bread recipe in this video. There's enough in here already, but that could be a whole video in itself. But I did make my own homemade jelly and it is the best. Let me know <laughs> Let me know if you want me to include it in a video here in June, because that's usually when I make my strawberry jelly. Um, but it's not really a Mennonite recipe. It's literally super, super simple, like two ingredients. Um, and it's a freezing type, so you don't have to like can it or anything like that. So that makes it really easy. Let me know if you'd like to see more details about that. But it's literally the easiest thing you can preserve. And then another part of a Mennonite meal is that you always pray at the beginning. Sometimes it'll just be a silent prayer. Now the way I grew up, we usually did not hold hands. Now my little family, we hold hands, we pray out loud. Um, but the tr traditional Mennonite way would be a silent prayer. And then you would dig in. Now, I remember my grandma often would not even set herself a seat because she was up and serving and that was what she was doing and she didn't even bother to set herself a place so that she could sit down and eat too. Um, and that was kind of common. I'm glad some things have changed. Nowadays, sometimes Mennonite family things are more like buffet style, a lot easier on the cook. Um, she doesn't have to be serving all the food yet too, but 
I have many memories of my grandma flurrying around in the kitchen and bringing out dishes one after the other because that's the next thing. Everything is usually served family style around the table. So you really can't dig in and eat your food until like everybody's gotten their stuff because as soon as you go to eat something, you'll have to be passing the next bowl, you know? So <laughs> I'm personally glad to see buffets becoming more of the common thing, but it's kind of cool. Like I have great memories of those sit down meals. They didn't feel formal though because everybody was talking at the big long table and yeah, it was, I don't know. I have so many good memories of my grandparents and my cousins and everything. So there's some traditions I would love if they would hang on. And one more thing, in a traditional midnight meal, usually water is the only beverage that is served, ice water. And then at the end, always hot coffee with to go with your dessert, your ice cream, your pie, that kind of stuff. So I'm sure the Mennonites down south probably have their sweet tea and stuff, but I'm just speaking from my heritage and my experience. Anyway, the ham is in the oven and it's about ready to get a glaze put on it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. the oven about 45 minutes before it was gonna be done and I just took all the skin off I used my mom's electric knife and that worked really good but at, after I got it kind of started I could just like pull it off with my fingers so that probably isn't hundred percent necessary but it did take me like 20 minutes in total just to get the skin off and the sauce on so make sure you figure that into your cooking time um, and then I just put it back in the oven again I never made an expensive ham like this before so it better turn out good the sauce tasted really good so I'm very hopeful <laughs> and you could probably use this recipe even on just like the preformed hams or like the pre-sliced ham or something like that too. Um, but I feel like with this bone in ham, it's gotta be amazing. Okay, we are about 30 minutes out from supper time and the stove is filling up. Next, I'm going to put some new potatoes in a kettle on the stove and I'm gonna cook these up, get them nice and soft, leave the skins on, and then we're gonna make some amazing brown butter crumbs for them and sprinkle some parsley on the top. Now, I did not grow these myself. They came from the grocery store, but I remember my mom would make these and we'd sit down to the table and she'd say, now look around. Everything that you're eating today came from our farm. You know, we have the green beans here. We have the new potatoes and, you know, and here's the beef from our cow. And I just know she always took great satisfaction and pride in that. And I think that would be such a good thing to pass on to my children if we had some land, you know, raise our own cow and stuff. But I still feel like we can get as close as possible by teaching them how to, you know, do some gardening and things like that because it just feels so good to know you're eating things that you've provided, you know, on your own properties. Anyway, so for the brown butter crumbs, I'm just gonna brown the butter like normal, and then I'm gonna add the crumbs in at the very end and just like mix it all up till it's like this globby, clumpy mess. And then you end up sprinkling that over your potatoes. It is so delicious and just, yeah. I mean, leave it to the Mennonites to put starch on starch, <laughs> but it's definitely worth you trying it out because it's delicious.
and you thought I was done with the starch. Well, no, next I'm gonna put some noodles on to boil. Yes, the sign of a superior Mennonite meal is when they offer both potatoes and noodles. Yes, I can't believe it, but um, traditionally Mennonites like their egg noodles and you can find them all different places. Here's just like a wider curly egg noodle. Um, but today I'm gonna be using the Heimgemacht, goodness, it's even in German, um, noodles, homemade noodles here. And they're just like really thin and like shoestringy. They're gonna cook up really quickly and be super amazing with brown butter on them. But if you want like a traditional Mennonite noodle, just look for anything that says egg noodle on it and you'll be fine. Oh, so we have the noodles, the potatoes, the gravy, the ham going. Things are about to even get more crazy. Josh will be home in a second, which I'm so glad for because the kids are gonna get up from their naps and I'm gonna need some help finishing up the last minute touches here. Anyway, so I need to focus and try to get everything done at the same time, which is the true magic of one of these meals. Try to get all these dishes done and perfectly ready at the same time. A lion. Oh yeah, I see. I want to hang out the rainbow color, and I figured that would look good with the clouds. I agree. It does look really good with the clouds. Okay, did you see what I did there? I cooked the noodles and then I added two little pieces of saffron to the noodles and they make them taste so good and have this really beautiful color. Now I will say, any Mennonites listening, I've heard of people that come to Lancaster County and they love all the food but they hate the noodles because they say we go way too heavy on the saffron. So let that be a lesson to us. A little goes a long way but it does add just a really nice robust flavor um, and makes you know, noodles, potatoes, whatever look nice and like yellow. And another thing about Mennonite cooking is that we cook our vegetables to death. <laughs> um, you're not gonna find like the crunchy restaurant style green beans at a Mennonite meal for the most part. I try to cook mine a little bit crunchy, but eh, still pretty mushy. That's just kind of how I grew up and that's how I like them. There's probably not a lot of vitamins left in till we're done with them, but yeah, that's the traditional way, I guess. Honestly, the reason that vegetables are probably so overcooked is because they're too busy with all the starches and the meats and everything else happening that they just kind of leave them on the back burner and they simmer a little too long. I'm starting to wonder. So I have the brown butter here on standby for the green beans and the noodles. And then I also have my brown butter crumbs for the potatoes. We have the green beans going, the gravy's going, the potatoes, the noodles, and things are just about done. I feel so tired. I've been cooking for like three hours straight, plus yesterday some. I hope my family loves this meal. <laughs> oh, hey, it's served with love. Okay, I'm about to carve up this ham here. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I've never carved a ham before, but first time for everything, right? Looks kind of fun. Um, it might not be pretty, but that shouldn't affect the taste, right? <laughs>
The food is on the table, ready to go, or about to call my family over here to eat. My four mothers would be proud of me. <laughs> I feel exhausted. I now understand what sacrifices my mother and grandmother made to cook with love. So good, so amazing. I'm excited to eat. I was kind of tasting here and there, so I know what's about to go down. So let's call my family to the table. footage for the conclusion but till the night was done I was very tired but everything was so delicious the ham was a highlight for sure the kids went back for seconds and thirds Josh loved it I will say though don't use any of that ham glaze to make your gravy I did because I needed more liquid and it just made the gravy taste like a little bit vinegary the glaze is amazing on the ham but don't use it to make the gravy I would say that was the only mistake everything else was so delicious. I mean, and we're gonna be eating those leftovers for a long time because that ham was probably enough for at least 10 people. So that's always a good thing, right? Leftovers. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you go try out some of these recipes, at least the brown butter. That will be life changing, right? And I don't know how soon it's gonna be till I do this again. Um, I think the hard part was just making all the different courses. I think if I would have just made like a meat and a starch and a vegetable, it would have been a little bit easier, but then that's not the way that I grew up for Mennonite meals, you know? Um, we always had all the sides and servings and stuff like that. Now, not every night or anything. Like, my mom didn't always cook like that, but I'm talking like a real, like, nice Sunday dinner, something like that. Sunday dinners traditionally were always our big meal of the week, and that's kind of what they would look like, honestly, most of the time, especially if we got invited away, you know, for a family thing or whatever. So, yeah, very good food. <sighs> a lot of burners going, a lot of dishes to wash at the end, but yeah, I hope you guys try out some of these. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Go make some of those recipes. They'll be linked down below, and let me know what else you'd like to see me feature in another cooking video in the future. I will see you in my next video, maybe this one here about make-ahead breakfast, or how about this one that I posted last week? I think you guys would really enjoy that one too. Thanks for watching. Bye.